this week, Parashat Vayeshev, we decided to talk about the story we haven't talked about yet in this week's parasha, the story of Eshet Potiphar, the wife of Potiphar that comes and desires Yosef and really wants to grab him for herself and then Yosef has to run out. But for some reason, she doesn't continue asking for him like she did every single day. For some reason, then she explodes and she goes and turns around and turns on Yosef and claims that he tried to do this to her and that to her and we know from there Yosef gets thrown into prison. Yeah, we really dive down and question whether we maybe never really understood what she actually wanted in this story. We saw a whole nother level of what was happening here and of course relevant again for us today. Exactly, because again, we'll just emphasize the question, if she really wanted him, why doesn't she continue the day after like she has done for so many days? What's going on over there in the story? What did she want then? If she didn't want Yosef, so what did she want? And as you said, this story is super relevant for us today. You wanna to take a look, hope you enjoy it. Parashat Vayeshev this week, so many topics, so many stories to talk about as we start following Yosef and his story in Sefer Bereshit. This year, what I want to talk about is the story of Eshet Potiphar, of what happens when he gets to Mitzrayim, he gets sold to Potiphar, he becomes in charge of the house of Potiphar, and then as we all know, Potiphar's wife fancies him, she wants him, and she tries to make her move. Yosef runs away, leaves his coat, his cloak, he leaves his beged behind, then she takes it and claims that Yosef tried to get to her and she blames him. Everybody gets upset at Yosef and Yosef is thrown down into prison. And when you read that story, there's a question that's been bothering me for years about this story. Because in the end of the day, if Eshet Potiphar really fancied Yosef and really liked him because he was so handsome, he looked so good and he was so successful. So why did she go and then blame him for doing what he did and not, on the other hand, try again tomorrow? If she really wanted him why when that happened why did she turn around and blame him and make this whole story about it and get him thrown into prison why did she not just try again we know that she never stopped trying it says every single day she would go over to him and try and try and try and try so why in this case did she give up what happened that day that changed everything and she decided to turn on him and blame him for things that he didn't do and by that get yourself thrown into prison it's very interesting and, and actually it seems like she herself has this moment where things change. She stands there and she looks and realizes by Yehi, suddenly she sees Kirota, Yazav Big that he left his clothing behind and then she suddenly starts this thing of blaming. And maybe we didn't actually get this right. Maybe we didn't understand what she really wanted. If we go back and we look at how this starts, there's so much description, not about his beauty. There's a word or two about that. But most of it is about the fact, the trust he was given by Potiphar. Everything he gave him, he trusted him. He saw godliness in his actions, in his doings, in his success. Everyone could see how God was with Yosef and was blessing everything he did. And she, she saw this and saw something else. This bothered her. She couldn't handle it. The words are, Batisa eshet Adonav eteneha el Yosef. She raises her eyes to Yosef. Interesting term. She raises her eyes because Yosef now is being lifted it up. It's not only he has everything, he's powerful. She's more powerful than him. He's a slave at the end of the day. That's not it. He's raised up as this moral person, this person that could be trusted, and she wants to prove otherwise. She wants to bring him down. She can't handle this morality, this being such a trustworthy person, maybe because she wasn't like that. Part of the hatred of someone is, let's bring him down. I'll show everyone that he can't be trusted too. And she tries to bring him down, and she tries to prove over and over that he will betray it. And she tries and he responds, I can't, he trusted me. He gave all his trust in me. I can't betray. But she doesn't give up. She will continue over and over. Until what? Until that one day where she holds big dobiada. She doesn't need to prove it anymore. She has the proof in her hands. And by the way, in Hebrew, the word beged, clothing, is the same word as betrayal. She has the proof now. She'll bring him down. She'll show. She doesn't need to convince him anymore. She has big dobiada. You know, this sounds like anti-Semitism all the time. They can't handle this morality. So what do they claim? Exactly what we're good at. That's what we claim. 
you know, we're the most moral army in the world. They'll claim, you know, you're the most immoral. You're doing genocide. This same point, Yosef, what everyone sees about him, and we see this continues later in jail, is that he can be trusted, that he is unique, that he's godly, that he sees that he's above other people. He's raised above most people. He's not like many who are so caught up in their jealousy and their ego. And she is, and she wants to prove that he's not. And that's exactly the point. He's not trustworthy. He's a bogeyed. When she has Bigdobiada, she already has achieved what she wanted all along. Very good, very good. I think maybe you can take this even a little bit further than what you said, because obviously there's something going on over here more than her just fancying Yosef. Because the question stands. The question, like we said in the beginning, why does she stop over there? Why does she continue day after day to chase him if she really wanted him? If the reason she wanted him was because he was so handsome and he was so desirable, why doesn't she continue? And the answer to that is just like you're saying is that she didn't want him that wasn't the point the point was she wanted to prove something and then you have to ask yourself okay what did she want to prove and when you look at the psukim when we keep on saying this every single time you have to pay attention to the hebrew and you have to pay attention to the details the torah repeats and the torah itself emphasizes time and time again and like you said the word begit in hebrew is not only clothes it's not only something you wear begit is the same root is the same shovesh of begida of betrayal there's something very very specific about the things she's holding in her hand and what she's trying to prove but on top of that pay attention to the language because first of all potiphar her husband we find him that he puts Yosef in charge of all the house. He makes him in charge. We know this word. We'll see it many times. But then, very interestingly, the Torah says, that Potiphar leaves everything he has in the hands of Yosef. And then, Eshet Potiphar looks to do the same thing. She wants to take everything that Yosef has. She wants Yosef to leave by her, in her hand, what Yosef has, what Yosef is. And it's the exact same words, the exact same terms that Yosef leaves his beged. And again, it's not necessarily the beged, but this is what she was in search for. This is what she wanted to prove. She wanted to prove, first of all, and above all, that Yosef, this guy, is so successful, not because of God. On the one side, everyone saw that Yosef was successful because of God. We see it in these psukim here. The Torah tells us that Potiphar himself sees that Hashem is with Yosef. Vayar Adonav ki Hashem he sees that Hashem is with him. He sees it. It was very clear. And then also we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu blesses the house of the Mitzri. Everything is blessed because of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But Eshet Potiphar doesn't want to recognize it. It can't be. There's nothing special here. It can't be that there's a God in the world. It can't be that things are happening and you're being successful because of God. The secret of you, of yourself, cannot be because of God. There's other reasons here. And more than that, just like you're saying, it can't be that you're so loyal. It can be that your success comes in a good and in a moral way. It has to be some kind of trick. Something's going on over here. And I'm going to be the one to prove it to everybody. Because then when she finally gets the beged of Yosef in her hand, and she has it in her hand, this is what she wanted. We see that she takes that beged, vatanach bigdo etzla, she leaves it by her. And interestingly, we don't even know if she showed it to Potiphar or not, because it doesn't say that Potiphar saw it. Very interestingly, again, we have to continue comparing by Yaakov, when they brought back his cloak, the Ketonet Pasim, they showed it to him, and Yaakov realized it was him. The Torah emphasizes that. But here, we don't know what happened with this Beged, besides the fact that she has it by her. Maybe she even left it by her forever. We don't even know if she showed it to Potiphar. This is what Eshet Potiphar wanted to prove. This is, like you're saying, the real anti-Semitism. She turns to everybody and says, Ishivri! Suddenly, this Yosef, this big guy, he's just an Ishivri. He's just a Jew. Look at this Jew. Look at this Jewish person. Look what he's trying to do to us. Hevi, they brought him to us. Look how he's bringing his dirt into our world. This is what Eshet Potiphar is saying to everybody around. This is what she was trying to prove all along. It was never about getting Yosef, but it was about proving and pushing her anti-Semitic views. Yeah, very interesting what you just said about Yaakov. We can't ignore the fact that something with Yosef is constantly around the clothing. The whole story starts 
started in the beginning of the parsha with this special clothing that he had, this kutonet pasim. And then, you know, they throw him in and they take this clothing and they show the clothing to Yaakov. And then again, he leaves, he's sent to Mitzrayim, he rebuilds himself there, he gets a new set of clothing. And then that clothing is left behind and again shows someone and again, he has no clothing. It seems that Yosef needs to go through this process. Yosef is unique and that's clear. It's clear about how people see him and we see this over and over. No matter where he goes, he's again in that position. But every time he has something external to show for it, he has this special connection to Yaakov, but he has this clothing and then there's this jealousy and then he loses that. And then again, they have this trust in him and they see godliness in him, but he has this clothing to show for it and he loses that. And then he ends up in jail with without anything. And it seems that only when Yosef doesn't have his begot, doesn't have this begot, which could be external, which could not always be telling the truth, which could be a boged, betrayal. It doesn't always show what's beneath it. When he's without that, and he continues to be Yosef, even in the depths of the depths in jail, still we see Yosef, Matzliach, and Hashem is with him. And that's how this whole story ends, with again, going back to the same thing where they leave every everything in Yosef's hands, even without any clothing, even without any covering, that's when Yosef can be Yosef. And we'll see later on that Yosef is Yosef even when he's completely hidden. He's covered in clothing which doesn't tell who Yosef is, which hides. The brothers don't know, don't see who he is. But Yosef stays Yosef in Mitzrayim because he got all the way to the bottom. He had all that clothing peeled off him and he still at the core continues to be this person who brings the name of God into the the world. That's when Yosef can really be and reach his true self. Very good, very good. Again, let's not forget that the second he gets out of prison, the first thing he does is by Khalef Simotav, they change his clothes for him because now he's starting his climb. Yosef is going to be adding, Yosef is going to be adding more levels to himself, like you're saying, until he reaches that point where he's on top of everything. He goes back to his first dreams where all his brothers are bowing down to him and realize his greatness. This is Yosef. And as we talked about last year, there's also Yehuda. Yehuda's story is happening at the same time. It's not that we take a pause in this week's parasha and we take a pause. Oh, let's see what's going on with Yehuda. No, the two stories happening here in parallel. There's the story of Yehuda, the story of Yosef. And again, interestingly, in the story of Yehuda, we there too have Tamar who claims against Yehuda and Yehuda steps up and admits right away she's right. Here we have a false claim of Eshet Potiphar to Yosef, blaming him for things. Later on, we're going to see that it ends up being that Yosef marries the daughter of Potiphar once he becomes the second in command in Mitzayim. And there's so much more to talk about about what goes on over here in this story, but we're out of time, so we'll end here. But as usual, the message, the message from this story of Eshet Potiphar is as relevant as always, because Am Yisrael, our nation, is an incredible nation. And we go through so many things and so many difficulties, hard times, but also such great times. And you really can't explain, you can't explain how this nation, how our nation has survived so long, has gone through everything, and how we're still building and growing, and how did we go from a holocaust in 1944, 1945, to building the state of Israel in 1947, 1948, how can we be this tiny little country in the world that keeps on being blamed for things that are exact opposite of what we do, keeps on being blamed for these lies and fake news time and time again, and yeah, we continue building. Really, at some point, you have to stop explaining. There's no explanation other than seeing HaKadosh Baruch Hu leading the way for us, and especially in times like this, this is what we have to continue reminding ourselves that our nation is strong because HaKadosh Baruch Hu keeps on leading the way for us and will continue leading the way for us. Shkoyach Yitzi. Shkoyach Tuvia. Shabbat Shalom. Chanukah Sameach. Shabbat Shalom and Chanukah Sameach. And Mitzvah Shem will talk to you next week. Glad to have you.